This is where it all starts. This is our core work. Now, core comes from a family of trees called acacia. And acacia trees are actually found all over the world. They're found in Africa, they're found in Australia. But Hawaiian acacia, or koa, has been separate from the rest of them. People who know their wood can look at the color of the grain and say, oh, that's Hawaiian koa. Now, koa grows on almost all the islands, but it grows best at the higher elevations on the island of Hawaii, or the big island. And that's pretty much where everybody gets their wood from. Now, once we buy our wood, we're going to air dry it for four years before we mill it. And that's really from my grandfather's time. My grandfather's wood that he bought was usually about four inches thick, and the general rule was about one year of drying for any inch of thickness. Whereas now, we usually get it thinner, but we stick with the four year tradition, kind of like Steinway, they dry their wood for seven years before they make their. So, um, once the wood's been dried, then the wood is milled, and then it's actually put into a drying cabinet for two more weeks before we actually do it. Now this is the other wood we use a lot of, which is mahogany. And uh, we use mahogany for our necks. And guitar makers have been using mahogany for many years. And the main reason is, well number one, if you're using a figured wood like koa, you start out with a block like this and you make a neck out of it, and you're going to have knots and Figure and all kinds of stuff where you don't want it in the neck, which makes the neck bleed. So the, the other reason is koa is a lot more expensive than mahogany. So number one, mahogany is very straight grain, so it's really easy to work with. Number two, it's less expensive than koa. And number three, it's a lot lighter. And the reason guitar makers use mahogany is because it's such a light wood, because the neck is a big part of the instrument. And the lighter you can make the neck, the lighter your overall instrument. So we can get two legs out of this one piece of So yeah, so the, the koa comes from Hawaii, the mahogany comes from South America, the rosewood and ebony come from India and Africa. So yeah, they come from all over. Okay. So once they've milled the wood, all the wood that they cut from the same block is kept together. The reason for that is when you open it up, you get batching grain. That's called book batching. So the body of the ukulele is actually six pieces of wood. Two on the back, two on the sides, and two on the top. Now the printer makers have been book matching for many years because they discovered a long time ago that if you want to make a one piece guitar top, you need a tree this big. But if you can make a two piece top, you need a tree half the size. So the main reason is economic, but the benefit is that the left side and right side match each other, and the glue line down the middle actually adds some strength to the top. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we are going to go to the far corner of the factory. We're going to start there, and then we're going to work our way through. As we enter this big door here, though, there's one step up, so be careful. So, this is what a pair of sides looks like. And normally what you would do with these sides is you would soak them in water and make them pliable. And then, pre-1900, you had a hot pipe. And you sat there, and you bent your wood on a hot pipe. So it was all done by hand, by eye. So when you see really old instruments in there a little bit, from the air, that's why. It was all hand by, by hand by But then they developed molds. And uh, the molds that we used for bending were actually metal molds that were heated by flame. And we would take our two pieces and we would bend them at the same time and we got our two matching pieces. And that's the way we did it for most of the time in the business. Now we use these benders. The great thing about these benders is number one, we don't have to soak the wood in water anymore. Bends it with the moisture that's already in the wood. And it bends in a two stage process. So there's a lot less stress on the wood. So if there's less stress on the wood, number one, you can bend a lot earlier when you're out of track. And number two, when you stress the wood, the grain tends to rise and you get the sand. So less stress is also less sand. So this first bender here just bends the waste. So when it comes out of here, it looks like this. And then the second bender here bends the two bottles. So when it's all done, it looks like this, and then we put it directly into the working hole, because if we don't put it in right away, it gets a straight line. Now these metal plates, they heat up to about 325 degrees. So it takes about a minute to bend it, and then it sits, sits in there for about six minutes, and then it opens up. So it's about seven minutes here and seven minutes here. Okay, so this inner area is what we call the assembly line. The outer area there is the parts department, so they make all the parts to feed the line. So once the sides come off the benders, the first thing that happens is they go into these working holes, and then they do the blocks in the bottom block and the top block. We 
see the top box a lot bigger because that's where the neck will go. So after that, then they're going to take this lining, which you can see is flexible, and they're going to glue the lining and they're going to clamp it down in the sliding box. So while it's drying, it looks like this. So at this point, this is when the Rucamella will get its date and its serial number. Okay? Because the date's put on here because at the next station they put the top of the back. Lining's mahogany and then right back there what they're doing is they're putting the braces on. Braces are spruce. So spruce, uh, spruce comes from Alaska. So you can see here, this model of the bracing is real simple. This is called a fan brace. The reason it's called a fan brace is because when you get into your larger instruments, there's more of them and it looks like a fan. So at this station, what he's doing is he's putting on the top and the back. Now here, he's got a top on. But before he puts the back on, our backs are curved. The backs are like a dish. So this is flat. So what he'll do is he's going to come over here. And these potter's wheels are actually dishes like this. Right? So he'll touch the pillow into the potter's wheel. And what that does is it angles all of our edges away from the center. Now all of our edges have a slight angle. Take our curve back and pull our curve back. Fine, this is our CNC machine. The main purpose of our CNC machine is to take a piece of wood that looks like this and turn it into a piece of wood that looks like this. About 90% of the time it's making pants. Now prior to that, Chris Kamaka made all the necks by hand on a grinder. And so all day long you can make pants. So this helps out a lot. The machine will also cut out our KKs for us. Uh, we have a little rectangle mother pearl and it'll cut out one KK up and one KK down. And it'll pocket the neck and so we glue in our own KK. The only ones we don't, we don't make the outlying KKs that are on the deluxes. Those are a little too complicated for us. So Pearl works in Maryland. Okay, so the question of anybody who works with wood is always going to ask us what glue do we use. We use Tech Bond Original. It's a red cap you can find in any hardware store. The only place we use a different one, we use Tech Bond 3 when we're doing the lining, which is the waterproof one. We're not using it because it's waterproof. The only reason we're using it is because Type on 3 is thicker than Type on 1. And when you're putting on all those little clamps, the, the lining tends to want to move on. And so they use the thicker glue just to keep the lining from moving. So there's no other reason. Otherwise, if Type on 1 was thicker, they would use Type on 1. Yeah, so everything else would go off of Type on 1. Okay. So this station here, what they're doing is they're gluing the neck to the bottom, or they're, they're fitting the neck to the bottom. Now from 2021 and before, he would glue the neck on and it would go through thinning. The problem with doing that is as you finish it, you get a lot of buildup in there. And so you would spend a lot of time sanding to try and get that clean. So starting last year, 2022, we switched to two piece body. So the neck is now bolted on. And so he's gonna fit the neck to the body once it's fitted, it's gonna come apart, it's gonna go through finish. When it gets upstairs, they're gonna refit it, make sure it's good, and you're gonna have a nice clean finish here, and then they're gonna glue the neck on. Now you might have noticed the Chipotle is a little bit different. So this is our Disney model. The only way you can get the Chipotle is you have to stay at the Aulani Hotel. You have to take the Chipotle class, and then you can buy the Chipotle. So they make you jump through a couple of hoops before you can buy this. Now, unless you're like some friends of ours who knew a rich Chinese guy from China who really wanted one, and he paid for them to stay at the Aulani, take the Gulele class, yeah. and buy the Gulele for him. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, does anybody know anything about Disney collectibles? What do you look for on a Disney collectible? Every Disney collectible is going to have a hidden pair of Mickey ears. So you, whenever you have a Disney collectible, you have to search for the hidden Mickey ears. On our ukulele, it's lasered on the back. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's lasered on the back right there. So it's lasered on the back in the corner right there. So at this station here, what he is doing, he's taking the front wire and he's pressing it in to the front slots. Once it's in there, he's going to cut it, he's going to file the edges. So when he's all done, 
looks like this. Now this is our rosewood board, so you can see the tang where the where it goes into the wood. On our ebony boards, you don't see that. Okay? And that's because we have what's called a bound fingerboard. And the way we used to do that is you would take a thinner board and then you would glue two pieces of wood on the outside. Right? So you wouldn't see it. Well, of course, now with modern machining, they can make the slot so it doesn't go all the way through. So we don't have, so we don't have to do that extra step with the two pieces. You do that with the Most of our fingerboards are cut with gang saw. Oh. Because they discovered um, with the CNC machine, so my grandfather used a gang saw. What a gang saw is, you got all these saw blades at the right spacing. You just run your board over one time and you're done. So later on, when we were having someone else do our fingerboards for us, they would do it with the CNC machine. The problem with doing it with the CNC machine is the blade is usually off to the side of the head. So you're constantly torquing your head. So eventually, you gotta replace the head, which is like $2,500. Uh, if you're making thousands and thousands and thousands of fingerboards, you can pay for it. But, um, even the guy who was making our fingerboards for us finally decided that the gang saw was a better way to go. So now, back to doing our fingerboards with gangs. So anyway, the problem with doing that, where the slot doesn't go all the way through, is you have to pre-cut every fret to the right side. And every fret's a different side. Yeah. So for the center here, you got fret number one all the way to fret number 18. So you don't want to drop this because it's real. <laughs> so behind us is the finish area. Through that booth is the spray booth. So in the finish area, what they're going to do is they're going to sand the cooler it down. It's going to go in and get sprayed. Come out, get sanded, sprayed, sanded, sprayed. Sand, spray. So we actually sand our ukulele seven to eight times. And um, the finish is really important. It's the first thing people see. But also, if you put too much finish on, you lose sound. If you put too little finish on, you lose protection. So everything with musical instruments is a balance between sound and strength, right? And so with the tops, um, you can make the top really thick and have heavy bracing, but it won't vibrate, it won't have a lot of sound. So you can do the opposite, you can make it really thin and hardly have any bracing, you don't have a lot of sound, but it'll break really. So our ukuleles are actually built really sturdy, because our ukuleles are passed from generation to generation to generation. And so we have to make our ukuleles to last. Uh, with any good musical instrument, as time goes on, the wood ages, it usually becomes more mellow and usually with nicer sound. Um, we have a custom shop, and in the custom shop, they make the ukuleles for the professional musicians. And in the custom shop is where we do our research and development. That's where they try different things. So they experiment with different bracing, different sizes, different. And when they find something that works really well, then it works its way down into the regular line. So the curved back started in the custom shop. Our tops are actually slightly curved this way. That's because the pull from the strings on the bridge would warp this wood. So to try and prevent that, we put a little curve in. And then the, the two-piece bodies. That all started in the custom shop and worked its way down into the ring. If you've never seen one before, this is what's called a thickness sand. So it's got these big sandpaper belts in it. And they're spinning this way, and so you feed your wood through on the conveyor belt, and you can get very precise thickness. And it's also flat. So when we first cut our wood, we cut it at about 3 sixteenths of an inch. By the time it's done here, it's about 3 30 seconds. Although every top has a different thickness because the 6 and 8 string are thicker because there's more stress and more tension. Whereas the standard concerts, less tension, they can be thinner. So yeah, every top actually has its own target thickness. The other piece of equipment we use a lot is our laser cutter. Before, when I had a top, I would have to put a template down and I would draw where the braces go and I would draw the blue then I would go to a band saw and I would cut it out on a band saw. And then I would go to a drill press and I would use a hole saw and I would drill it, drill it out, drill out the hole. So it was a lot of steps. And now, now with the laser, the laser will actually mark where all the braces go and it'll cut it out for us all at one time. Now the other thing we do is we also cut our sides out on the laser because our sides have a compound curve on it. The curve goes like this. It's much easier to do on the laser than on the Yeah, the whole reason, because of the laser, you get a souvenir. Right? Because when we used the hole saw, there was a big hole right in 
So usually there's those at Christmas time that teachers would come by and they would make garlands at home at school. But yeah, now that we're lasering it, we can we have somebody as a But this is what we're going to do now. We're going to go upstairs to Panoza. So when the ukuleles come out of the spray booth, the first thing that happens is they go into the drying room for at least 24 hours. The deluxe is actually staying for about a week. And uh, once they're dry, um, when, it, when they're soft, it's really easy you can scratch it. So once it's hard, it comes out here, and the first thing they're going to do is they're going to glue the bridge on, which is what you see on this shelf here. They're gluing the bridges. And after the bridge is glued on, then they're going to glue the necks on, which you see on the top shelf and the third shelf. So after the neck is glued on, they're going to dress the fingerboard, they're going to put the nut saddle on, they're going to put the label in, they're going to put the keys on, they're going to put the strings on, all that finish work is done. Now once the ukulele is completely finished, it goes in the corner there and that's Krista Maka. That Krista Maka does the final check on all the ukuleles before they go out the door. So he's going to tune them up, he's going to play them, he's going to check the intonation, and he's going to check the finish one more time. Now right back here we do our repairs, and back there we do our binding. So you can see it's a pretty small place, but all of the kamakas are in the Now we have about 25 employees, 20 in the factory, 5 in the office. Uh, we, to complete a uh, classic ukulele, takes about two and a half working weeks, so about 12, 13 days to finish a classic. And um, last year we made about 2,400 ukuleles. Uh, Pre-pandemic we made about 3,500 ukuleles. But um, you know, a couple things, supply issues, but also we changed our finish to make the finish better, so the ukuleles take a little longer to go through finish now. And also, there's a trend towards the fancier ukuleles, so we're making more of the fancier ones than the classic. Ones. So when he's putting the top and the back on, there are these two pins that make sure it's centered, you know? so that way you can make sure it's centered. So the top and back are actually oversized slightly, so once they're glued on, because the sides can, can move this way, right? So if you made it perfect and the sides move a little bit that way, you know, it wouldn't fit. So you make the top and back slightly oversized. So that's why he has that shaper right behind him because when he's all done, he's gonna, he's gonna, yeah, make that all. How many people does Chris the Locker reject? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's great. So um, it's actually yeah. very few because structurally the instrument is being checked multiple times at Hillsdale. Yeah. So by the time it reaches Chris, there's very seldom that there's going to be structurally wrong, something structurally wrong with the instrument, which means we can't suffer. Because they'll normally have caught that early. And if there's something caught downstairs that is what we call a third, they're going to chop it up downstairs. So it's never going to reach up. Every now and then he'll find a new quarter, like he'll find rock that everybody missed or something like that. But that's, that's pretty good. The main problem is usually the finish. So you're going to have little nicks, scratches, hair in the finish. And, but the guys here in the front, they usually catch that and send it back down. So by the time it gets to Chris, it's usually pretty good. So Chris is mainly doing that final nut saddle adjustment, making sure um, everything's right on the instrument. Now, one of the big checks that's done is a uh, body test. So when the body is first completed, before it has a bridge on it, before it has finish on it, when the body's first done, they're going to be thumping the body. And they're going to be listening for a certain vibration, a certain drum sound. If they hear it, it moves on. If they don't hear it, it usually means the top is either too thick, meaning they got to sand some more, or the top is too thin, it has to be replaced. So that's sort of the big check that's done. Now, when Sam Jr. took over in 1954, he actually had to find more employees because um, my grandfather had been shutting everything down. So his wife, Geraldine, was an occupational therapist, and she was working with a young white man, 16 to 18 years old, and they were all deaf. And she said, why don't you hire these guys? So he did. And so we had four or five deaf employees who became our core for the next 40 to 50 years. So the longest one stayed with us 53 years. But, um, but they would see Sam tapping the human. They said, what are you doing? And Sam would say, this is a good one, this is a bad one, this is a good one, this is bad one. And pretty soon they could feel it in their fingers. And so when a noisy factory, a hearing person got to do this, there's a deaf person just went down. And so for many, many years, that initial sound check on the body was done by a deaf person. The nuts and saddles originally were wood, but wood wears out really quickly. So then they were switched to plastic, and plastic actually lasts a long time. It's pretty good, good um, nut and saddle material. But then people wanted something that was a little more, you know, because bone is like the big thing. So they wanted something a little harder, and so then we switched over to taurine, yeah. like you know your countertop. So we were cutting. If anybody's ever cut taurine, you know that smell. 
where they, they were cutting nuts and saddles on the story mm -hmm. and stuck this place up now. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so then um, actually uh, we found a company called that there's Tusk. Yeah. So now now we use Tusk, uh, which is a man-made material that mimics bone. And one of the important things is uh, so on the level. The distance, so so back before, this was just a flat, straight sap. But the distance from here to here actually needed to be slightly different for every string because the thicker strings need a little more distance, thinner strings, less distance. So in the old days when all you had was pitch pipes and tuners that made sound, nobody could really hear as you went up, it was getting a little sharp, it was getting a little flat. The only people who noticed that were professional musicians. So the professional musicians would notice it, they'd come in, and we'd know what was wrong, and we would hand adjust their sounds. Well, along came the darn clip-on electronic tuner, right? <laughs> and so now everyone's a musician. Everyone's going, my tuner says it's sharp here. My tuner says it's flat here, right? right? And so that's when we have to go to compensated sound. And so the graph deck is perfect for compensated saddles. So all right, if you look at our saddle, it starts off this way, and then it goes this way on the thick string, and then it comes back this way. So they're compensated. So that's the one thing if you're a left-hander and you want to order a left-handed ukulele, uh, and you flip your strings, we need to put on a left-handed saddle. Okay? Now the other thing that happened because of the electronic tuner <laughs> was the geared keys. Now we took a long time to, to get geared keys on our small ukuleles because we have never liked the look of small ukuleles with side keys. We just don't think they look right. So on the standard and concert, we stuck with the straight friction key for many years while we waited for someone to come out with a gear straight key. Now they did have two different keys. They had a violin style plastic key, which was geared. But the first time we looked at it, one of our guys pulled on it, it came apart, and the guy was like, don't do that. And we're like, okay, that's not gonna work for our ukulele. And then there was the banjo keys, Banjo keys are really big, and the gearing is right in the middle, very obvious, right? So um, we asked Schaller, who makes our, our side keys, to make one, but there wasn't enough demand. I guess they never made it. So Goto of Japan was the first one to come out with an all-metal gear key. So once Goto came out with the key, and we liked it because they hit the gearing behind the head, so it wasn't real obvious, um, we started switching our ukuleles over. Now, a regular set of friction keys is like 20 bucks, but a set of Goto's is like 90 dollars. Yeah. So you're not going to find it on your real, you know, inexpensive ukulele that you buy. Um, you're only going to find it on higher instruments because you know, it's a hundred dollars just for a set of keys. Mm -hmm. But um, they're fine-tuning keys, and you know, I mean, I actually switched all my, all of our personal ukuleles over at the house. We switched them all to the Goto's just because they, they tune so much. Thank you very much for Thank coming you. on the tour. Thank you. you enjoyed it. So what we'll do now is we're gonna go down the stairs, out the back door the way we came in. If you have cameras, some people like to take a picture while they're on the stairs into the factory. Yeah. And the other thing is as you exit that back door, don't forget about that step down, don't trip. And if you think of any questions on your way out, I'll be right behind you.